And we got criticized and, you know, the pharma people said, oh my God, you know, there's four ingredients here. This is so dumb. Um, so, uh, you know, I tried to prove everyone wrong with my own personal money because nobody funded either of these studies. And we did a study with super high dose coenzyme Q10, which is what everyone was using at the time to treat mitochondrial patients. And what did we find? Nothing, no reduction in oxidative stress, no reduction in lactate in 30 genetically confirmed patients in a randomized trial. So my point there was to target these complex um, processes which are going on with aging and going on in our mitochondrial patients. We need to think about where the problem is to come up with safe ingredients uh, that are logically targeting more than one of the final common pathways. And, uh, and so that's generally been our approach. Now we've, we've taken that approach to obesity. We've taken that approach to aging. We've taken that approach to skin health. We've taken that approach to infertility. And uh, what was the final one? Radiation damage as well. And uh, essentially all of them have been successful by taking a multi-ingredient approach to target the mitochondria, but also to add different ingredients depending on what the clinical indication was. Uh, but we have uh, studies in, but we have uh, studies in mice and with obesity, and aging in humans showing the benefits of, of this approach, especially with obesity. Uh, we've got a really nice uh, clinical trial showing that this uh, this approach worked well. Okay, a few things to go back in, back to there, and then sure. like talk about the obesity. Uh, that that trial looked very interesting. Okay, so creatine is a like an alternative energy source to the mitochondria. So does it actually help the mitochondria, or is it just helping the cell produce? energy? That's a great question. Uh, and I think it's doing several things. Number one, its canonical um, role is to uh, increase the total amount of what's called phosphocreatine. So as we transition from sitting to doing exercise, you know, upwards of eight to 10 seconds of energy uh, is derived from phosphocreatine breakdown to regenerate ATP in the cytosol. However, when that happens, the ADP that goes up actually is, 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 is eventually signals to the mitochondria to turn them on. So what happens is that the free creatine then crosses the outer mitochondrial membrane, mitochondrial creatine kinase then takes the ADP and ATP ratio, pulls it into the mitochondria, ADP come into the mitochondria through the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that turns on a mitochondrial respiration. So uh, this creatine, phosphocreatine shuttle that was first proposed by Theo Wallyman, I think shows the link between creatine and activation of the mitochondria. And if you knock out both of the creatine kinase enzymes, both the one in the cytosol and in the intramitochondrial form, you actually see significant impairments in function in the animals. So there's definitely a relationship between creatine that's much more elaborate, I think, than just the phosphocreatine in the cytosolic component. Uh, there's also been innumerable studies uh, showing that there is neural protection, uh, which is likely multifactorial, but in head trauma, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's models, and we and others have published in Lou Gehrig's disease as well, benefits of just creatine monohydrate on their own. I think, and we haven't done the studies yet, that if we had creatine plus a specific mitochondrial enhancer, we'd probably get even more benefit. But creatine alone was shown to be beneficial in uh, in many, many mouse models of neurodegenerative disorders. Interesting. Well, I will, I will keep it up. Keep up <laughs> taking creatine. I, I take creatine. It's one of... Oh, yeah, I, I definitely started... So the, the CoQ10, so that's to support the electron transport chain. So CoQ10 is a big molecule, right? It's got this really long tail. Is it absorbed orally um, or, or do you need to take precursors? No, and that's a good point. So what happened is about 30 years ago, some of the earlier forms were at very little bioavailability. And in fact, the bioavailability is pretty, pretty poor um, even now. Um, but um, some of the newer forms, especially if it's a liquid form, and there's a company called um, um, uh, Tishcon uh, that has come up with some formulations that are fairly well absorbed. And, you know, we've used, we've used their uh, CoQ10. So we showed for sure in 2007 that we had almost a tripling of CoQ10 concentrations in the blood in our randomized trial. And that was at steady state. So that clearly shows that it goes up. What happened though, is when the, you know, 30 years ago, when it was poorly absorbed, people came up with analogs. So one was called idabenone, which is a CoQ10 analog, and people have come up with MitoQ and other strategies they've had to try and, you know, increase the uptake. 
of the of CoQ10. So the problem is it's very lipophilic, as you pointed out, with this really hydrophobic tail. And so uh, they've come up with strategies to try and enhance the absorption. But uh, you know, most of the newer forms um, are well absorbed, and even the powder form. Uh, when we actually measure it in the blood, uh, we, we can find that it does go up. And I guess at the end of the day too, you know, you can hand wave about whether it goes up or not in the blood, but when it's doing something biologically uh, in the cell, it, it, it clearly must be getting there. But uh, clearly we've shown that uh, we do get an uptake. Now, any way that you could enhance that uptake uh, would likely be favorable. Um, most of the CoQ10, uh, which, is, um, it, which is taken, is converted to something called ubiquinol. So there's all this hand waving about take ubiquinol versus ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is CoQ10, but in the blood, 99% of it gets converted to ubiquinol anyhow. So I'm not really sure what the value is of taking ubiquinol versus ubiquinone. When in all of our studies, we're just good old CoQ10 or ubiquinone as opposed to this ubiquinol. But I guess drug companies are making a lot of money trying to push this somehow ubiquinol is better with no evidence. Okay. And alpha lipoic acid. So you have two, you have two antioxidants. You have Yes. like vit vitamin e which is the fat-based one and alpha so could you talk about so why alpha lipoic acid because there are like many other antioxidants you could have picked yeah we picked out alpha lipoic acid because it is critical to uh, many of the mitochondrial enzymes so as i mentioned pdh pyruvate dehydrogenase very very important enzyme which is really your entry into the tca cycle uh, and branch chain ketoacid dehydrogenase uh, those are some of the, the more common ones. So they're in intramitochondrial. So we knew that alpha lipoic acid is transported into the mitochondria, and that formed the basis as to why we chose it. And there had been some studies in, for example, diabetic neuropathy, which showed some benefits with alpha lipoic acid. So we knew quite a bit about you know, clinical trial safety, other than a little bit of reflux. So we'd always recommend taking it with food. There seemed to be very few side effects with, uh, with alpha lipoic acid. So that was one of the rationales behind it, because we wanted a redox couple for the CoQ10 so that if you gain an electron, eventually you can give that electron back so you can become reduced and oxidized unless you have a redox couple. So that was our, our rationale behind it. Right. So the vitamin E, so is it a tocotrienol or a tocopherol or does it matter? Yeah, yeah. so we use alpha tocopherol. Uh, and uh, so it tends to incorporate into the membranes and it's a chain breaking antioxidant, which uh, tends to protect the membranes. So that was the rationale behind putting the vitamin E in there uh, so that we could protect the inner and outer mitochondrial membrane as well as the um, plasma membrane.